This time on Superstars, the dits, the dancer, the designer, the detective, and the director. Diane Keaton is happy to reveal the secret behind her long career in movies that have grossed well over a billion dollars in North America alone. Being funny, making a fool of yourself. Famous for her habit of laughing one moment, crying the next, she got pretty emotional when describing a scene from Something's Gotta Give at the Berlin Film Festival with Jack Nicholson. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shut up, man. But she, it was sweet because it's about being a mother and a daughter. And, you know, look, I love my mother. And I love my mother so much. So it meant a lot to me. So the whole thing meant a lot to me. And I'm so tired that I just think I'm gonna go insane. <laughs> this is the way she uh, is. You think she's funny in the next minute? Look at this. You think that <laughs> it's real, too. You want a relationship, I think, is Diane's is like ditzy, self-deprecating you know, acting style first struck dies. gold as the title character and in Woody Allen's 1977 film, shock. Annie Hall. Woody Her lover at the time, Woody based Woody the character Woody loosely on Woody Diane's real-life personality, person. even using her nickname Annie and her original Grammy. surname Hall. Yeah, it won her an Oscar for Best Actress, and her performance in Annie Hall ranks at number 60 on Premier Magazine's All-Time 100. I want you to live with me. How, whose idea was it? Annoyingly, yeah. she didn't even have to work hard to nail the role. Uh, I approved it immediately. Well, I, just, I just thought about how easy it was with Woody. Everything was so easy. It's kind of like shocking. Like when Annie Hall came around, I just thought, well, I guess it's always going to be this easy because he's got a loose style with actors and he's not sentimental. It works with me. He doesn't like to sit around and talk about your part or beat it to death. After her golden run of films with Woody, she earned another Oscar nomination for Reds. 1988's Baby Boom ushered in a new career in more commercial vehicles, which included both installments of Father of the Bride and First Wives Club. In 2003, she kicked a goal for older women by arousing the romantic interest of a young doctor in Something's Gotta Give. The role of the insecure workaholic writer was one she could relate to. I completely identify with her dilemma. Because I think that we make excuses in our life to say our life is okay, we work harder, you know, we are consumed by success and uh, sort of uh, watching out, wary. As we get older, we get more and more wary and more and more suspicious and less and less able to throw ourselves into situations and open up. And so I identified with that, and that's why the flowering of this woman of 55 is so sweet. To me. Her string of mainstream crowd pleasers continued with the family stone in 2005. And co star Sarah Jessica Parker was clearly bowled over by her. You know, honestly, at this point, just being able to say that she's my friend is such an honor. I know it sounds like silly, but it's just the truth. She's just an amazing woman. Father of the Bride co-star Martin Short also has some great memories. Well, some are printable, unfortunately, but um, I would say just the hang is great. She's just fun um, to be in a movie set with. And most of that is waiting around and talking, you know, and gossiping and, and laughing. And that's, you know, obviously her work stands for itself, but just being in her presence is the most rewarding for me. In Because I Said So, Diane once again takes top billing as the domineering discontented mother of Mandy Moore. She prefers meddling in her daughter's life rather than focusing on her own. He made mothers. What? That was on a Hallmark card we gave you. Despite her incredible endurance as a Hollywood leading lady, she was so stunned by her recent honor from the Film Society of Lincoln Center, she forgot to wear her gloves. No, I, I couldn't believe it, of course. And But what's more moving to me than anything is that I have these friends who are actually going to sit there and talk about me. You know how much work that is? I, I feel like I don't deserve this, and I, 
don't know. I, I, I feel like, of course, I'm going to sob or something, like a big baby. And uh, You are? You promise. I'm going to bring it right back, I swear. No one would lay a bet against that. John Travolta tripled sales of white suits and Cuban heels in the 70s with his hip-thrusting turn as Tony Monero in the disco classic Saturday Night Fever. The next year, his multiplying chills electrified a generation of teenage girls who screamed their way through screenings of the musical Grease. The film's soundtrack, which featured several songs performed by John, went on to sell more than 10 million copies. Then the aptly named Blowout kicked off a decade-long string of flops, interrupted by Look Who's Talking and its sequel. While out in the wilderness, he helped Richard Gere's career by turning down roles in American Gigolo and an officer and a gentleman. 62% higher rate of getting cancer for non-smokers who live with smokers. What are you trying to say? You don't want me to move in yet or what? But John finally hitched his way home from oblivion on the back of Quentin Tarantino's Pulp Fiction in 1994 and hasn't looked back since. His rekindled success didn't surprise his fellow Pulp Fiction star Harvey Keitel. The guy just exudes a certain joyfulness and is contagious. You feel good being around him. He's one of the most entertaining actors I've ever seen. My name's Chili Palmer. After Chili's scoring a hit as a Lone Shark movie buff in 1995's Get Shorty, he reprised the role of Chili Palmer ten years later in Be Cool. I produce feature motion pictures. I got an idea for a movie. Doesn't everybody? He'd had plenty of time in between to reflect on the coolness of his character. Well, I think, uh, you know, Chili loved all the classic cool characters like, um, you know, Sean Connery and Bond or Brando or Dean or... You know, I, I think that it's innate in him to, to be Cary Grant, you know, to be all those guys. Because he loves movies, he loves music. Might be comforting to me. In 2004, he got a kick out of playing the really bad guy in Marvel Comics' adaptation, The Punisher. No, Mickey. What would your father think of this? Well, it was classic in that it was high-end evil. Do you know what I mean? It was uh, this guy being hoity and kind of a blue-blood wannabe. And, you know, he, he thinks he's got good money, but it's all bad money, you know. And uh, it's more fun to play that. Away from the big screen, John is perhaps best known for his obsession with flying. Not only does he pilot his own Boeing 707 passenger jet around the world, he reportedly has another four planes parked on his Florida estate. Married to actress Kelly Preston since 1991, John is also well known as a Scientologist. His religious beliefs appear to have clouded his judgment when he bankrolled and starred in 2000's Battlefield Earth based on a novel by Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard. It won John a Razzie Award for Worst Actor. Thankfully, it didn't dent his popularity. Still riding high in his 50s, he revved up Tim Allen and Martin Lawrence in the midlife crisis movie on wheels, Wild Hogs. What'd you do that for? For the good of the trip. You don't need a GPS to discover America. You need a bike and you need the road, OK? Freedom. And if we have an emergency, I got a cell phone. You don't. What? Hey! Why'd you do that? I got all my data in there. Well, how does that feel, Woody? It's good. Woo! It's my prerogative. <laughs> no cell phone. Wait a minute. No, it was more uh, jokes at each other's expense. Wait a second, sorry, sorry. Uh, that kind of thing. Although one time, I got so mad at Tim because he kept on rev. He had no muffler on his bike, so it was deafening. I mean, like it will puncture your eardrum. And he would do it, and he would do it antagonistically. He'd look at you, and he'd rev it, and look at you again, and rev it, and you'd just say, Sam, please. I mean, uh, Tim, please. And he, when he did, wouldn't stop, I took my bike, and I started to bang his bike on the back of his wheel, and I, I banged him in a circle. And every time he did that, I did that. So it was the only thing that shut him up, you know, with the bike, and it worked. Clearly not afraid of his feminine side, he also revived the part played by Divine in a remake of the film Hairspray. The larger-than-life role of Edna Turnblatt required him to don a fat suit. Hairspray was a, 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 was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. Five hours of makeup every day, uh, throwing that very large body around and uh, dancing. 
you know, I play this woman who's 300 pounds, and to, to jump and leap and, you know, and do things uh, was fun, but, but hard work, you know, it was, but effective, it made, it made everybody laugh. Okay, let's get this straight. Record producer, rapper and designer Sean John Coombs, formerly known as Puff Daddy, then P. Diddy and sometimes called Pampy D, now goes by the nickname and recording name of plain old Diddy. Everywhere except Britain, that is, where he lost a legal battle with another artist called Richard Diddy Dearlove. Um, I'm Diddy in the United States, in the UK I'm P. Diddy, and it was just lucky, lucky for me that I had more than one name to choose from. I got a call that, that somebody said that they had the rights to the name Diddy, and I was like, you know, I respect that. You know, I have no problem with it. You know, I, I'll just be P. Diddy in the, in the UK. So it was kind of funny to me, but it was, everybody jokes about the different name changes, but being that I have many names, it, it came out as a blessing. His swag bag of identities also includes his real name, under which he runs his clothing empire, designing for two labels, Sean John and Sean by Sean Coombs. After the hours he must spend searching for the relevant business card, it's a miracle he has any time left over to devote to his existing ventures without adding to the list. But in the summer of 2006, he chose the occasion of his annual white party in Saint-Tropez, to celebrate the release of his new perfume, Unforgivable. Every year I come to San Jose with my family on vacation. Um, it, it's a place that's beautiful. Um, it's nothing like this place in the whole wide world. And, you know, I, I think this is the perfect place to celebrate the success of Unforgivable. With so many strings to his bow, Ivanka Trump finds it impossible to decide what she likes most about Diddy. Oh, everything about him. Just general fabulousness. His first album as Puff Daddy was No Way Out in 1997, which sold 10 million copies worldwide. While dating Jennifer Lopez, he released another Puff album two years later, and was charged with possession of a weapon in connection with a shooting at a Manhattan nightclub. He was also charged with attempting to bribe his driver to take the rap, pardon the pun. He ended up beating the charges, but his associate and co-defendant copped a 10-year sentence for first-degree assault. He bounced back a changed man in time to release The Saga Continues as P. Diddy in 2001. By 2002, he'd made Fortune magazine's 40 richest people under 40 list. And since then, he's been popping up everywhere, running a marathon for charity, designing sneakers, even appearing on Broadway in the 2004 revival of Raisin in the Sun. One critic accused him of being so unconvincing that he seemed like a bystander rather than an active participant. But he still had plenty more pies and fingers, and the same year he scored much better reviews for his label Sean John, which was named Best Menswear Designer of 2004. By the time he was asked to host the MTV Music Awards in 2005, he'd recovered his confidence. I'm hosting the awards this year, so I think that the, we all know that the in, my entrance is going to be key. I, I want to give an entrance that's going to kind of set the tone. I'm in the studio now and working with some of my, you know, design people from my tours and stuff, and we're trying to do something that's that's just right. It's not over the top. It's not, you know, trying to be, you know, too um, tricky or anything like that. We want to really set the tone with the introduction. So basically, um, I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of 2006, he was ready to release his first album in four years, calling on the collaborative talents of Christina Aguilera, Nas, Brandy, and Big Boy from Outkast. It went to number one in the US in its first week of release. I think the sound is hip-hop soul, you know, but I think it represents the evolution of, of my sound as a producer, just um, from the sounds of growing up in the 70s and listening to hip-hop in the 80s, making music in the 90s, and, you know, where it all has evolved to all my travels, the sounds I've heard from Ibiza and dance clubs in Miami, and just international sounds, you know, fused in with authentic hip-hop, you know. It's music that makes you want to dance, music that makes you feel good, and it's also um, music that I got a chance to be vulnerable 
vulnerable on and talk about different things. Unfortunately, it wasn't music that he'd be able to share with his fans during his planned tour of the UK with fellow gun-toting rapper Snoop Dogg. The tour had to be axed after Snoop was barred from entering the country following his conviction on gun and drug charges. Sandra Bullock was raised in Germany by her opera singing mother. She shot to stardom opposite Keanu Reeves in Speed and became one of Hollywood's biggest grossing female talents in the late 90s, with films like Miss Congeniality and Two Weeks Notice. The sequels of Speed and Miss Congeniality earned her 11 and 17 and a half million dollars respectively. She now ranks number 14 on the list of richest female entertainers. On top of all that, everyone she works with loves her. It was, it was just a joy every day, you know, she has so much energy and uh, she gives everything uh, f for a film, you know, once she works on a film, she's putting all her energy in it and she always wants to make things better and better. She never stops fighting, you know, for the best shot or another better idea. Because she's extremely talented and beautiful and funny and then really down to earth. And you can't beat all that. <laughs> on receiving her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2005, Sandra reciprocated the appreciation. People kept asking, how does this feel? And I feel awkward and I feel, I don't feel worthy because the only reason I stand here is because of the great works of all the people that allow me to do my job. Away from the limelight, she's known for her generosity, having twice donated a million dollars to the Red Cross. She also spent the day of the September 11 attacks at a Manhattan hospital. As all of New York's phone lines were down, she sent emails from her Palm Pilot on behalf of patients trying to contact loved ones. But she's most loved for the kooky beauty and comic timing she first unleashed in Speed. The unstoppable chemistry between her and Keanu Reeves was still in top gear 12 years later in the lake house. Just keep circling, you'll be fine. Yeah. Did yeah. you? Yeah. You did? Yeah, sure. Did you think I was cute? Yeah. You did? Hot. <laughs> You're funny. You're cool. <laughs> she may have been persuaded to work with him again in a film about two lonely people bridging a two-year time gap by way of a magical mailbox, but Sandra wasn't entertaining the prospect of teaming up for a third installment of Speed. Are you joking? Did you see Speed 2? Did you see it? You saw it? Were you forced to see it? So sorry. It was free. 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 He was someone, someone, he was smart. I was not as wise then, but I learned a lot. Had it not been for Speed 2, I wouldn't have had incredible experiences after that. In between the light comedy and romantic fluff, Sandra has also turned in more serious performances, tackling the issue of drug and alcohol addiction in 28 days and portraying a racist pampered wife in 2005's Best Picture Oscar winner, Crash. so much that we crash into each other just so we can feel something. In 2006, she played novelist Harper Lee in the second film in two years about Truman Capote's experience of writing In Cold Blood. What you're doing, the truth is enough. I've worked on this book ceaselessly for four years. <laughs> Next, she signed up for the thriller Premonition, which centers on a suburban wife and mother who's informed that her husband has been killed in a car accident, only to wake up the next day to find him alive and well. It was only a dream. Everything's going to be A fluent German helped her communicate with director Menin Yapo on set, and the film took $17 million in its opening weekend. But that doesn't mean she's turning her back on comedy. With some inconsistencies. A lot of times comedies aren't, aren't looked at as character work or legitimate and I'm okay with that because I will continue to make those kinds of films but I also will continue to strive for roles that I love and that expand what I know I can do and tell stories with a group of actors that I think will inspire for two hours or hour and 39 minutes um, and tell, a, tell, a, tell an incredible journey so whatever package that comes in Hopefully, I'll, I'll be able enough to go after that. The surprising link between Quentin Tarantino and Sandra Bullock is that after writing and directing Reservoir Dogs in 1992, Quentin was asked to write the script for Speed. 
He turned down the offer and headed to Amsterdam to concentrate on his own project, Pulp Fiction, which walked away with a palm door at the 1994 Cannes Film Festival. As well as reviving John Travolta's career, it won Quentin and his former video store colleague Roger Avery an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. The episodic gangster tale, which broke all the rules of conventional storytelling, was also a deeply referential and reverential work, paying homage to a staggering number of movie influences. Be cool. Somewhere in the middle of nowhere. He sold his script for Natural Born Killers, but disowned it when director Oliver Stone made changes he disagreed with. He went on to write and star in Robert Rodriguez's 1996 action horror film From Dust Till Dawn. His next film as a director was the 1997 black exploitation tribute Jackie Brown, starring Pam Greer, Bridget Fonda, and Robert De Niro. The film was a hit, but drew criticism from fellow director Spike Lee for overuse of the word nigger. Come in on this thing with me. You got to be prepared to go all the way. After laying low as a director for six years, he exploded back onto the big screen with his two-part revenge epic Kill Bill Volumes 1 and 2, which borrowed from the traditions of Chinese and Japanese martial art period cinema, as well as spaghetti westerns and Italian horror films. Unlike his first three films, which were all noted for their predominantly male cast, the plot of Kill Bill centers around a female heroine bent on avenging the death of her unborn child. I mean, this, these are the ultimate girl power movies. And that's one of the things I wanted to do. You know, there was an aspect where it's like, you know, at the end of the day, and the movie's rated R and stuff, I don't give a damn about that. My feeling is, I actually want 13-year-old girls to see this movie. I think this movie will be very empowering for them, and they'll get a big, big kick out of it. The story goes that the plot of Kill Bill was developed by Quentin and his leading lady, Uma Thurman. Despite gushing about her in public and admitting she's his muse, Quentin has always maintained that his relationship with Uma is purely platonic. However, when she fell pregnant just as filming for Kill Bill was due to start, he refused to recast the lead role, insisting on holding out for Uma. Oh, you know, Miramax is going to wait for me, but there is just no point in doing it without doing it with Uma. And I knew if I waited, film history would thank me. The two films combined grossed over $300 million worldwide. In between his own projects, Quentin has also given a leg up to a number of smaller independent and foreign films that may otherwise have slipped under the radar by tagging them with the label Quentin Tarantino Presents. In 2004, he presented the Chinese martial arts film Hero to the US, and it ended up with a number one box office opening. Then, after hearing Eli Roth's sick idea for a follow-up to his first film, Cabin Fever, he jumped on board to present the graphic and disturbing horror, Hostel. And when I heard that, I was like, man, don't do that remake crap. I won't even see that if you do that. You gotta do Hostel. That's, that's, that's what the fans wanna see. That's what I wanna see. It's gonna be the bomb. And uh, then inspired him, and he uh, and uh, he went and wrote it, and asked me if I would uh, uh, be involved with it, and I was happy to. It was Costell ended up being the warm-up act to Quentin's next directorial project, an ambitious double bill of back-to-back -back horror films in collaboration with Robert Rodriguez. Now Tarantino and Rodriguez are bringing the Grindhouse back with two explosive feature films. Our idea behind it when we came up with the idea was to actually create what an experience of going to a grindhouse in the 70s was like. You know, so it's like the movies had to work and they had to work so good that we could yank them out and just release them on their own and that would be a good movie on its own and worth the price of admission. But now you're gonna add them together and you're gonna create that experience with the stuff in the beginning of it, the, the machete trailer, the trailers in between. It's kind of creating almost closer to like a grindhouse ride and that was the experience we were trying to get give an audience 